Together, the firm produced over 7,000 individual titles that were then sold through dealers in almost every major American city. And the firm both produced images that reflected the interest of the public, while also at times making political statements. Welcome to Polk's America. I'm Thomas Samuel. The 1800s were a transformative time in American art history. Technological changes enabled faster presses. The invention of photography allowed artists to capture images like never before. But arguably, one revolutionary change in the printmaking process shaped American visual arts more than anything. The rise of lithography. In this episode, we welcome Tennessee State Museum curator Annabeth Hayes. Her presentation, Cheap and Popular Pictures, Courier and Ives' depiction of 19th century America, introduces us to the largest lithography firm in the United States during the 1800s and explores the impact, for better or worse, that this prolific firm had on American popular culture. Here's Annabeth. Courier and Ives were the most prolific and arguably one of the most important lithography firms of the 19th century. Before the rise of photojournalism, many Americans relied on looking at hand-colored lithographs and other prints to see the events that they read about in newspapers. The firm initially began with Nathaniel Courier, who established an independent business in 1834, and he was already a successful lithographer when he joined forces with a man named James Merritt Ives in 1852. Based in New York under the name of Courier and Ives, they produced some of the country's most popular wall hangings in the 19th century. Their prints depicted a wide range of subjects from political events, urban and rural landscapes, humor, sports, and household activities, among others, and their sons continued the family business until they ultimately sold it in 1907. Courier and Ives lithographs depicted American politics and culture, from presidential candidates to dramatic scenes of war to natural beauty and everyday human behavior. Now housed in museums and with private collectors across the world, the firm's prints were once ubiquitous across this country. In 1942, author and collector Harry T. Peters wrote about the firm and its founder. Nathaniel Courier's lifetime covered the conquest of the West, the harnessing of steam, the rise of industrialism, the Civil War and its aftermath of Reconstruction and Unification, there were years that saw an uncertain young republic establish itself as a great power, the formative years of a great nation, years crowded with events that cried for accurate and graphic presentation to a public that was becoming increasingly alive to the tempo of the times. Such a presentation, the firms of N. Courier and later Courier Knives, were to provide generously in the form of inexpensive yet finely executed lithographic prints that made their way into nearly every home and became, in an amazingly short time, an American institution. Now, while Peters was writing under a lens of nostalgia and popular memory, there is no denying the impact that the firm of Courier Knives had on a public who quickly devoured the visual imagery that finally accompanied news that could otherwise only be read about. Annabeth explained that this relatively inexpensive artwork was popular among Americans of all social classes. A single print cost between just 5 and 25 cents. So how could these prints be produced so cheaply and on such a large scale? And for that matter, what is a lithograph? Lithography, though, was actually invented in the late 1790s in Germany and then the process was improved upon in France and England before finally reaching success in the United States about 20 years later. To briefly explain the process, a lithographer would cut a stone to the size of a sheet of paper, grind it down until the stone had a smooth finish, carefully draw an image on it with a special kind of crayon. He would then moisten the stone with water and then roll ink over it, which would then attach only to the drawing and was repelled by the water. And although this still sounds like somewhat of a tedious process, lithography was the first new printing technology in over 200 years, and it offered a more affordable and efficient way to mass-produce prints to sell to a large market. Why was lithography such a big step in printing technology? 
What made it different from previous methods? I reached out to Phil Sanders, master printer and author of the upcoming book, Prints and Their Makers. Lithography is a planographic printing process, which means the image area and the non-image area of a printing plate are on the same surface. This is a great departure from the printing processes that preceded it, first being relief printing, where the image area is raised and the non-image area is carved away and much lower than that raised printing surface. Intaglio printing, the opposite of relief printing, the image area is below the surface of the printing matrix, ink is applied to those recesses, and the raised surfaces are wiped clean. Lithography was a massively disruptive technology in its time because it did two things. It increased the speed of printing and lowered the cost of each impression, which increased the number of people that would not only commission prints to be made, but also then be able to purchase the resulting printed material. When you think about images being produced, at the time, the only way for people to own an image was to purchase a print, which may have been made in one of these more expensive processes, or to purchase a painting or drawing directly from an artist. Once lithography became available, it was easier for images to be disseminated into a wider audience because of that lower cost. The process was simpler, but could be time consuming depending on the detail and difficulty of the print. Mass producing prints on the scale of Courier and Ives required an assembly line of sorts. Instead of relying only on one person to complete the entire process, most firms were instead staffed by a number of people. Those that created the design, those that carved and grained the stones, those that rolled the ink, those that colored the final prints, and countless other people. And it was these specialized jobs that helped companies like Courier and Ives streamline their business model. And in doing this, the company was able to minimize production costs meet the demands of a rapidly changing news cycle while still producing compelling illustrations that appealed to a pretty wide audience. They had lithographers, colorists, and artists both on staff and others who essentially worked as independent contractors who sold designs to the firm that really contributed to the staggering number of images that they produced. And while we do know the names of some of the artists like Fanny Palmer, Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate, Louis Maurer, George Dury, among some others. Many of the staff members were immigrants, and these people brought with them their own perspectives and lived experiences to the prints that they produced, which they then shared and impacted to the greater public. Together, the firm produced over 7,000 individual titles that were then sold through dealers in almost every major American city. And the firm both produced images that reflected the interest of the public, while also at times making political statements. In the President James K. Polk Home and Museum's collection, we have several lithographs produced by Courier and Ives. I asked the curator and interim director, Candace Candido, about one particularly interesting print, an 1841 copy of The Death of Henry Harrison. Okay, so this is our copy um, here in the collection of the President James K. Polk Home and Museum of the Courier and Ives print called Death of Harrison, which depicts um, the death of President Harrison um, in April of 1841. And this is a really fun print to look at when talking about Courier and Ives and their um, you know, earlier prints, because if you compare this one in our collection here, to other examples of the same print, Death of Harrison, you can see some pretty noticeable differences. So I'm looking at um, a comparison print here that's actually in the collection of the Ohio State Library. Um, same print, but you can see compared to ours, there's a lot of differences. So in our print, there is a lot more ornamentation going on in terms of detail in the bed curtains. There's a wallpaper. There's um, a print and pattern in the carpeting. Um, there's some ornamentation on the frame of the portrait that's hanging on the wall. So really just an increase in the richness of detail that's happening. There's also some more subtle things. So if you look at this little table here, 
Um, in both prints, there's what looks like a teacup with a spoon and some bottles, um, presumably medicine. Um, and in our print, the teacup is facing the opposite direction. Um, interestingly, the bottles seem to be spilling over um, in the version in the Ohio Library. It's almost like the medicine has been tipped. Um, sort of an interesting interpretive change there. So these are all you know little details that we're seeing that um, the individual printmakers are choosing to change as this print evolves and is produced in different editions. Um, so even though we kind of think of prints as carbon copies, um, they in fact can have some kind of fun and interesting variations between them. And one of the most obvious ways that happens is with the coloring. So all of the um, color is added um, by hand after the fact in these prints. And so you see variations in the colors that are applied and also the technique of application. So um, our copy here in the collection, the color is a little sloppier maybe. There's spots where it seems to be um, overflowing or covering up details that were actually accented in this copy in the Ohio State Library. So um, the hand of the colorist there is another factor that can produce differences between prints. Part of the firm's production process included colorists, who were often young German immigrants, usually young women, who were responsible for applying a single color to the lithograph after it had been printed. You can think color by numbers, but at the highest level. And they applied these colors based on the model print that was usually completed by one or two of the staff artists. And the model print usually included in the notes dictating special instructions or if certain changes needed to be made. And the more popular prints were then reprinted as the demand increased as well. To accommodate such a broad span of topics, it necessitated artists being assigned with topics that they would otherwise be unfamiliar with. Lewis Maurer and Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate were often responsible for the American Indian prints. In a later interview for Harry Peter's book, Maurer admitted that neither he nor uh, Tate had first-hand knowledge of the American Indians when they were working on these prints. And instead, they researched them at libraries and based their own illustrations on other images, uh, which included the art by a man named George Catlin. Catlin, however, and some of his contemporaries are now seen as controversial figures in the art world. George Catlin was a painter, but he also considered himself to be a scientist and an explorer. In the 1830s, as different American Indian groups were forcibly removed from their homes, ultimately leading to the culmination of the Trail of Tears, Catlin traveled and visited these tribes. And over the course of his travels, Catlin visited over 48 individual tribes and created over 500 paintings depicting portraits, scenes, and landscapes while also collecting American Indian artifacts for his own collection. Catlin was considered one of the first artists to depict American Indians in their own communities, and he is credited for painting them as a human being rather than the negative savage stereotype. Today, though, Catlin is considered a controversial figure because, despite his intentions, he exploited the American Indians that he came into contact with. To further his artistic career, he would sometimes even bring them along with him in order to advertise his paintings at his exhibits. Furthermore, despite Catlin's intentions, it does not appear that Tate and Maurer used these images in the same way. In the pursuit, the focus is instead on the European American hunter overcoming his American Indian adversary, with other hunters in the distance attacking American Indians. And it's this kind of image that would have encouraged the us versus them mentality to his largely white audience who would see this print. And at its core, that message was against Catlin's own artistic morals. However, this savage, othered stereotype continued to be associated with American Indians throughout the 19th century. And this is the power of art, or at least art as a commodity. The prints produced by Courier and Ives often reinforce stereotypes of Native Americans, people of color, and immigrants. The firm represented the ideas and biases of its biggest customer demographic, white people. But despite the abundance of prints and the firm's attempt to reach Americans of all social classes, their prints were really aimed at white Americans, as the firm frequently romanticized history and current events 
And while this rosy view might have worked with cartoons and images of children, the same approach was also taken with most of the images that depicted the lives of enslaved people. And instead of showing the horrors of life on a plantation, the firm, for example, would instead depict a romanticized home life in the country, showing happy slaves who were content with being owned as human chattel. Even in prints depicting black northerners, the images used racist stereotypes. After the end of the Civil War, Courier and Eyes produced a series about a fictional black segregated community called Dark Town. A team of artists created over 100 prints for this series that perpetuated racist stereotypes of black, about black Americans, many of whom were recently emancipated. And these racist stereotypes in this series implied to the white audience that black Americans were ignorant and uneducated. These prints that came from the nation's most popular lithographic firm demonstrated the prevalence of racist attitudes that were still very much a part of the United States at the end of the 19th century. The images were reprinted thousands of times even after the business ended, responding to the demand and popularity for them. And this further reinforces how images like these supported the systemic racism that was perpetuated throughout the 20th century as well. Lithography ushered in a brand new era in image consumption. By the middle of the 19th century, lithography was able to produce color images on such a scale as had never been seen before. As a result, it became possible for the publishers of printed images to begin to reflect society back to people in ways that they were not accustomed to. With cheap printed material, it became possible to reflect culture back in many different ways, ways that were aspirational, promoting, say, the purchasing of products or the way in which to live a life, promoting news or events of the day, uh, clearly demonstrating events of the time, or also to help create a social structure from which to operate within. Courier and Ives participated fully in this. Their images were disseminated widely. They printed thousands and thousands of impressions of these images and made many of them over their long tenure as a company. It's easy to look at some of the more famous images where you see, say, the sleigh riding scenes or pastoral landscapes and settings and think about the beauty of nature or simplicity of life. But when you get into things such as the Dark Town series, you start to see the power and influence that a printed image can have over the maintenance of the status quo when it comes to the social structure of a society. The Dark Town images, without a doubt, are images that promote a racist agenda, that which would, is, was intended to demean and disenfranchise African Americans at the time. It was intended to maintain a feeling of white supremacy or white superiority within the society through printed imagery. It had a twofold effect. When you think about how a culture sees itself, there's those who see this as a reflection of the way that they believed. There's those that see this as a reflection of what they worked or fought against. And there are those who are the recipient of that sort of content, that ideology within the larger society. So images, no matter if they're advertising or if they're intended to be a consumer image of something for entertainment or enjoyment, they have a large effect on shaping and developing the psyche. So the publishers have a great responsibility in choosing what it is that they put out into the world, especially when something is in multiple. It's one thing if an image is created and there's one of them and you have to take great pains or effort to go see this particular image. It's another thing when there are thousands of that image that are disseminated out and spread broadly, that whose access to that image becomes more commonplace. It becomes easier. The threshold to see that work uh, requires less of the, of the audience member. Being that Courier and Ives also printed works for very inexpensive sums. It made it possible for people to collect those and then those images to hang in homes or in businesses and continue to have influence long after the time of purchase and their point of being printed. Printed material is so valuable because it persists. When you do something in, a, in multiple and in an addition form, those, the likelihood of something persisting is much greater. 
there's much, much, much greater possibility that not only one will survive, but many will survive. And so that work or that written text has the potential to survive and influence much longer and greater than the years from which it was made. So when you think of the responsibility of a publisher, they have a duty in order to produce work that they believe uh, will influence society in a certain way. So we have to ask a lot of questions on who has access to that. Publishing and printing generally are completed or done by those of greater means. And so it's the perspectives of a narrower set of a more powerful and influential portion of society that had great influence and sway over the images that were intended for the masses. So when you think about the responsibility and the role of the publisher, you also have to think about the perspectives of those people and the issues and ideologies that they are looking to promote and or preserve. Courier and Ives was a firm that was part of its time. It promoted an agenda for the preservation of its own perspective as well as their own class. And in in doing so, helped perpetuate racist ideology and a racist agenda against African Americans. The popularity of prints like those in the Darktown series showed the extent to which Courier and Ives prints could influence popular culture and attitudes about race in the United States, the ramifications of which can still be felt today. But there were other ways in which the firm influenced American perspectives. In the Tennessee State Museum collection, we have other Courier and Ives lithographs, many of which depict scenes from the life of Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson was no stranger to portraiture. With the exception of George Washington, Jackson's image was captured more than any other person of his time. And this was in large part due to a man named Ralph E. W. Earle, who was a portraitist. The historian Rachel Stevens describes Earl as a court painter that served throughout Jackson's political career. Earl met Jackson after the Battle of New Orleans and was commissioned to paint this painting of him um, at the battle. But Earl ended up marrying Jackson's niece and subsequently even moved with Jackson into the White House after he was elected as president. Together, Jackson and Earl created a cult of personality around the Tennessee politician that was used to further his career and minimize any of his transgressions. Earl's portrait cemented a visual reference to this specially cultivated Jackson persona that left a long-lasting influence on the American public even after his death. Likely inspired by some of Earl's works, the M. Courier firm depicted numerous images of Jackson that included a print model that is a presidential portrait, an imagining of Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans, and even a piece of lore from Jackson's childhood in which a British soldier is thought to have slashed a teenage Jackson with his sword. And it's these scene prints in particular that would have encouraged a collective memory of the president, ultimately reinforcing the identity that Erlen Jackson had crafted for him. When Jackson died, Nathaniel Courier and his firm quickly produced a print depicting the president's death. And in this print, which is in the State Museum collection, Jackson is surrounded by family members mourning his recent passing, and they are consoling one another and even praying. And while we can recognize this as a scene of mourning today, in its time, this image would have likely evoked a strong emotional response to its viewers depicting Jackson's death as the loss of a great hero while obscuring his egregious crimes against American Indians and enslaved people. Courier and Ives maintained their popularity by responding to cultural trends. The firm commoditized national moments and created works that met the interest of consumers. This art was specifically designed to elicit an emotional response from a large number of Americans, which in turn translated to profit. Mourning, however, was also a part of the culture of the 19th century, and it led to Americans using creative ways to process their grief. Many young women, in particular, created mourning watercolors, embroideries, hair jewelry, and other forms of memorials to their loved ones. Around 1846, a young woman named Sarah Caroline Gwynn from Sumner County, Tennessee, painted this watercolor of a young woman leaning against a large tombstone, and it appears she is crying. And the tombstone is inscribed, 
to the memory of L. B. W. Gwynn of Captain H. F. Murray's Company of Tennessee Volunteers, who departed this life at Camargo, Mexico, October 11, 1846, aged 21 years, and it's followed by another prayer. Young Sarah painted this water watercolor in honor of her cousin, Littleberry Wright Gwynn. He was a soldier from Carroll County, Tennessee, who died during the Mexican-American War. And the arrangement of this painting is similar to many other memorial arts of the time, in which a person, usually a young woman, is standing next to a tombstone in a cemetery, and it usually looks like she's being supported by the tombstone of her loved one. Courier Knives artists used the same imagery for their memorial prints, which were likely commissioned. These kinds of prints were another way that the lithography firm responded to cultural trends. Master Printer, Phil Sanders. One of the great successes of Courier Knives as a publishing house was their ability to create a reflection of life as it could be, a more idyllic version. Many people purchased prints and put them in their homes or their businesses and looked at them in an aspirational way much as people purchase images and prints today, whether they be posters or photographs. The difference here was this was the first time that it was able to be possible for an average citizen to be able to purchase such an image. So the aspirational quality and aspects of what was happening with Courier and Ives' early work really was a foreshadowing of how advertising would come to create the consumer society as we understand the United States today. Without printmaking and without specifically lithography's ability to produce colorful, cheap, and expensive, widely distributable images, we would not have the society built as we do today around presentation of a world through this other format, through a visual way of seeing things outside of ourselves to allow us to aspire or project that upon ourselves. And when we extend that out to social responsibility and we think about the times that we're in today, printmaking in and of itself is so valuable, not just in producing, say, the ephemera of an ongoing protest movement or whether it be a political agenda that's to be promoted. It's how all of that persists and lasts and we have that record of this moment and of this time through the printed material that was used to create the changes that are occurring today. Printmaking is so valuable and that it allows the average person an ability to really speak about their time in a way that they can share it with others. Many will equate printmaking and social media um, as far as their effects in similar ways, but I draw a very distinct difference between the two. Social media lives in a digital realm that will exist in that realm for as long as that realm exists. And I often talk about the possibility of an information dark ages that we are potentially in today because if we do not take the technology of today, all this information, all these thoughts and ideas, all these videos and, fo and film footage and photographs of what's occurring today and transfer them to the next technology, they will cease to exist. Whereas prints and printed material will still physically exist. As a print, printer myself, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of printing things out, printing those thoughts and those ideas to create that physical record. Because it's through that physical record that we know which ideas will persist and which ideas will continue. And the importance of that cannot be understated. That is the, what we have, that is our legacy that we leave behind, that we know we will have access to. We're still able to hold prints from 500 years ago, from 1,000 years ago, and we're still able to see how those materials were used and for what purpose. And it allows us to hold them, to be present with the maker many, many years, generations, centuries after they were first made. The value of that cannot be understated. Physical things, we are physical people, and those physical things mean a great deal because that's how we relate to our world and it's how we can leave something behind. It's the legacy that we leave. And so when we look back at the legacy of Courier and Ives, there are many advances and wonderful things that were produced as a result of it, but we also need to look at the society in which they created as a result of the work that they had done. 
and and having the physical record we can go back and we can look at that and we can be critical about that and we can have a good discussion about that and we can use that to improve the way in which we move forward and to adjust the printed record to reflect the society that we want to be that's the value of art and the value of printmaking in, in particular is that it provides us with that opportunity to project towards the future to be better than what we are today curator annabeth hayes now, despite the success of the firm and their artist's ability to comment on countless genres related to 19th century American culture, the firm eventually dissolved. Nathaniel Courier and James Ives left the business to their sons, but the sons had no interest really in transitioning the business to keep up with new technology. Lithography evolved once again into chromolithography, and many newspapers were now incorporating the involvement of photography to produce illustrated weeklies that provided drawings and photographs that corresponded to their latest news cycle. Even so, there is no denying the impact that the artists of Courier and Ives had, whether they were making political commentary, increasing awareness of popular culture trends, or sharing images of important players and events. The work of Courier and Ives set an idyllic backdrop for mainstream 19th century American culture. This has been Polk's America. Our guests were Annabeth Hayes, Curator of Decorative Arts at the Tennessee State Museum, Phil Sanders, a fine art master printer and author of Prints and Their Makers, a new book about contemporary collaborative fine art printmaking and how the relationship between the artist, printer, and publisher is shaped and is continuing to shape our culture through art. Prince and Their Makers is published by Princeton Architectural Press. Visit philsandersprintmaking.com for more information. And finally, Candace Candido, curator and interim director at the President James K. Polk Home and Museum. The Polk's America Lecture Series is brought to you by Heritage Bank. Heritage Bank and Trust is here to make your life better, from personal and business checking and savings accounts to loans that will make your dream home possible. Heritage Bank and Trust is proud to be your community bank. Contact them at 931-388-1970 or visit their website at heritagebankandtrust.com to learn more. Member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. The Polk's America podcast is produced by the President James K. Polk Home and Museum in Columbia, Tennessee. I'm your host, Thomas Samuel. Thanks for listening.